Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, dear viewers, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Muhammad Al-Shif, your host of Elixir Life from Saudi TV Channel 2 is kicking off another inspiring and informative episode with our distinguished guest, Dr. Abdullah Khathlan, to talk about very important topic, viral hepatitis. Beside of that, we have very interesting segment, but our uh, episode theme is viral hepatitis. Stay tuned for a special episode. Once again, we'll, welcome back to Elixir of Life. Our next segment will be talking about the quote of the week. To watch more details about this report, stay with us. Once again, welcome back to Elixir of Life. Now we are coming to the most important segment. We will be talking about hepatitis, viral hepatitis, in particular hepatitis C. It is one of the major global killer with estimated mortality 1.23 million per year, which is comparable to HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria. To talk about more details about the diagnostic method, clinical presentation, about the management, and the new advances and state-of-art strategy in treatment of hepatitis C. It's my intense pleasure and honor to present my distinguished guest, Dr. Abdullah Al Khathlan, who is a consultant uh, GI with subspecialty transplant uh, hepatology from King Fahad Medical City. Welcome, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. And uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, be uh, a guest in your uh, great show today to speak about this important topic. The pleasure is mine. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for being uh, with us. Uh, without further ado, we'll start our uh, discussion about viral uh, hepatitis. First, to start, uh, what's uh, viral hepatitis in a nutshell? Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, in regard to the uh, viral hepatitis, uh, like if we want to summarize, we can say that those are a group of viruses that uh, infect the liver as the main target organ. However, they may also infect other organs, but primarily they infect the liver and they can cause over the long term um, complications and um, eventually what we call cirrhosis of the liver. Mm, excellent. Uh, what causes uh, viral uh, hepatitis and uh, how does somebody get uh, viral hepatitis? So if we want to like, uh, divide the uh, issue on two topics, many topics, we can have the acute hepatitis and the chronic hepatitis. So for the acute hepatitis, we have uh, viruses that comes an, as an acute and then they go away after a while, like after a few weeks. Uh, usually they don't linger in the, uh, in the host or in the patient. Um, those are mainly hepatitis A and hepatitis E. So again, from their name, they just um, um, cause an acute infection. Um, they become symptomatic and then eventually the infection resolves. On the other hand, chronic hepatitis, mainly hepatitis B and hepatitis C, those are the uh, infections that happen in the liver and they linger usually uh, and cause chronic uh, process that's usually in treatment. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, so uh, what's the prognosis if you have acute viral hepatitis? Uh, is it, I will say, yani to, if you give you know, two options, to get viral hepatitis chronic, 
versus acute, which will have more prognostic, you know, uh, value. Mm -hmm. So it depends on which virus are we talking of and which patient is getting the infection. Mm -hmm. So from the uh, perspective of the virus, uh, hepatitis A is usually a self-limiting disease um, unless there's high-risk features in the, in the host or in the patients. Uh, those at the extreme of age, like very young uh, patients at so one month or less, or patients who are at the extreme age on the other side, like eight-year-old or, or more, or those who have uh, like multiple comorbidities, those patients may have some uh, like complications from an acute episode of hepatitis. Uh, rarely they may end up in uh, liver failure. Excellent. But overall, um, acute hepatitis is again, acute uh, hepatitis A is self-limiting disease. So I wish that I will not get any, but if I have to choose, probably hepatitis mm. A is the most uh, self-limiting disease. Excellent. So more, if you more acute presentation, more uh, lay resolution or clearance compared to chronic. Uh, yeah, exactly. So the chronic hepatitis, like hepatitis B, it may present as well acutely. So the patient may have an acute symptoms. Uh, but again, it depends when the patient will get the infection. Uh, if they are young, most of the patient will continue to have a chronic uh, infection while if they get it at an adult uh, age, uh, most of the patients, like 90% of them, will clear the virus. Um, like m uh, most of the virus will be cleared and only a remnant of the virus will, will remain in the, in the body. Uh, on the other hand, hepatitis C, the main topic of our talk today, um, when, it's, when anyone gets the infection, most of them will get uh, eventually chronicity. So the virus will linger in the body and it will turn into a chronic infection that usually will lead to some complications on the long run. So if you have acute presentation of hepatitis C or P, I would say this is like a blessing because more uh, clearance. If it is asymptomatic, it will end up with uh, chronic yeah. uh, disease? Probably, probably yes. Again, especially for hepatitis B, most of the patients, if they get it in, in adulthood, and if they get symptomatic, uh, like the, the color of the skin changes or they get some pain in their uh, liver, uh, most of them will spontaneously clear the virus. That's a little bit less with hepatitis C as um, around like 60 to 70 percent, even if they get symptoms, they will uh, end up getting a chronic infection. Excellent, Dr. Abdullah. Before we uh, dig uh, deep in the topic, uh, somebody will ask how common is viral hepatitis in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? So that's, that's very important uh, because we should always look at the problems that are common in our uh, population. Mm. Uh, so looking at um, all the viruses, for hep well, starting with hepatitis A, we don't have a lot of good data about hepatitis uh, A, but it's quite common. Um, at s some studies suggest that uh, up to like 5% uh, of the population gets an acute infection at one point or another. Uh, for hepatitis B, uh, here we have uh, an excellent success story. If we look back uh, like 25 years ago, at certain areas in the kingdom, uh, the prevalence of hepatitis B or and like the number of, or the percentage of patients of the population who had hepatitis B, it was up to 10%. That changed dramatically since we started the vaccination, uh, the complementary uh, uh, vaccination program. Uh, since then, the incidence of hepatitis B dropped from 10% to like less than 1%. Oh, great. So okay. that's, that's a great success story. And that's highlight the importance of the uh, vaccination program that the government has implemented. For hepatitis C, um, it is, again, the proper or uh, great studies are not uh, yet available, but we have an estimation of around like 1% of the population have uh, hepatitis C. Excellent. Uh, for Minister of Health, uh, do you have any, let's say, vision? Because the World Health Organization, the vision is to eliminate hepatitis C by 2030. Yeah. Hmm. So um, the Ministry of Health has like, started an ambitious program in order to eradicate hepatitis C completely from the kingdom. Uh, we have started in multiple fronts, uh, spreading the awareness, um, like making people understand what is hepatitis C and understand what are the changes that happen with hepatitis C and now it's curable a disease compared with the past where the cure was quite difficult for hepatitis C. And they have even the, like worked on uh, making the medications for hepatitis C, the new medications available here, and now we are actually producing those uh, medications locally, which has significantly increased the uh, access for medications for most of our patients now. Excellent, great talk. Okay. What are the symptoms of uh, acute uh, viral hepatitis? So again, it will depend on uh, the type of the virus and the uh, which host or which patient will get the virus. 
um, if we're talking about hepatitis A, which is the most common acute uh, hepatitis, typically the patients will get um, abdominal pain, um, some vomiting. Uh, they may have some pain at the uh, liver site, which is in the right upper uh, area of the abdomen. Um, again, uh, vomiting, and eventually they will turn, uh, the skin will turn to yellowish color. Um, that's usually the symptoms of, uh, of hepatitis A. With the uh, yellow uh, discoloration of the skin, usually the patient may also complain from uh, like itchiness uh, in their mm -hmm. skin. So typically that's the mild form of acute hepatitis. However, um, for other viruses like hepatitis C, most acute infections can be asymptomatic. That the patient will not Excellent. know that they will have uh, hepatitis C. So the acute uh, virus that could be asymptomatic to, let's say, full-blown picture, you mentioned they will have yellowish discoloration, we call it jaundice, yeah. nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Do you have the, I mean, the, can you just elaborate more uh, about the liver anatomy and the location? Because you mentioned the pain on the right, okay? So, yeah, so like if I yeah. want to use myself as a model, so this is the liver. Excellent. The liver is like it's situated here. So if there is a pain, usually it's under the rib cage. Um, the rib cage, the right, yeah, because uh, right if, upper. Yeah, because there's uh, like stretching of the capsule of the liver. Mm -hmm. There's a capsule that covers the liver, which is very sensitive to pain. Mm -hmm. So when there's an inflammation process within the liver, it will get stretched and that will induce uh, pain. So that's, um, that's usually what happened with hepatitis uh, in general. In general, it will uh, like cause uh, an infection within all the liver, not a segment of the liver. Mm -hmm. uh, Diffuse. Uh, yeah, but it will usually, typically, uh, all the liver will be involved. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, because it, it is a great mimicker for other, you know, uh, forms of, let's say, hepatobiliary, you know, uh, diseases like gallstones, um, liver uh, abscess, etc. How to differentiate it? Is there any w clue by history that can differentiate? So, um, yes, yeah, can be difficult, uh, especially some of the other diseases that you mentioned, they can present in a similar way, like a stone that gets stuck in the biliary tree. It can have the pain, it can have the change in the color of uh, the eyes. So here you have to go and ask the patient some questions that may be a clue for you. If you have, um, if the patient has been contacted with someone who has hepatitis A, for instance, then that would make hepatitis A at a, at a higher probability. Uh, if the patient, for instance, um, has recent um, injection of drugs that from an uh, unsafe uh, source, like those who abuse drugs, then and then they develop this jaundice or this yellowish discoloration of the skin, then you would think about hepatitis C or hepatitis B. Uh, but eventually you have to go and put your hand in the patients, examine them, and look for clues that they may have uh, acute hepatitis or another cause. And at the end, we will have to do some blood tests and uh, imaging to, uh, to know what's well. So you look for the risk factor, it's yep. important. The risk factor that will differentiate you know, viral hepatitis from other hepatobiliary uh, yeah. diseases. Exactly. So uh, how soon after exposure to hepatitis uh, virus symptoms will appear? Again, uh, I'll have to go to this uh, every time you ask me. It depends on the virus, uh, exactly. because um, each, we, they're all called uh, hepatitis, but they are completely distinct viruses. So hepatitis A uh, typically takes- So we call it incubation periods. So yes, uh, the incubation period. Typically it is 28 days, 28 give or take, uh, oh. give or take um, between two weeks up to six weeks. Uh, that's usually when uh, the or the incubation period uh, for hepatitis A, and typically the once the patient gets infected, they will be able to spread the virus until they develop the uh, the jaundice until their skin turn yellow. Once they turn yellow, typically they will not be infected anymore. So that would be a clue for us that if we are isolating such patient, then there is no need for isolation anymore. For hepatitis B and C, um, the incubation period is um, like it has a wide margin. It can be between uh, one month and up to six months. Mm. Um, so it can be, it can lag uh, compared with hepatitis A. So that's very interesting that uh, patient will be like viral hepatitis A uh, in the incubation period, asymptomatic, they are infectious, okay, too. Yeah, and uh, once they, like, the, the, between the incubation period and the start of the process of the replication of the virus, mm -hmm. uh, there can be a, also a lag, uh, that mm -hmm. asymptomatic lag, that the, uh, if you do lab test, you will find that the viral load is, or the, uh, the liver enzymes are elevated, but the patient is completely asymptomatic. He doesn't show the, the signs. At this process or that uh, time, the patient is uh, spreading the virus. Excellent. So you, you mentioned that uh, a patient, you know, presented with acute hepatitis. To assure the patient, uh, what are the duration of the symptoms? How long will it, you know, uh, 
will last. So they are uh, typically, if we are talking about again hepatitis A, because that's the typical uh, acute, acute virus, mm -hmm. um, there are two types of symptoms. The first are the like the general upsets from the liver and the GI tract when he has like vomiting, cannot tolerate uh, food, um, feeling uh, low energy, some pain in the liver. So this usually doesn't uh, lag for a long period, um, probably uh, 10 days or 10 up days. to two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that can linger for a quite uh, long time is the uh, jaundice or the change in the color of the eyes and the skin. This can take up to several weeks to completely resolve. Mm -hmm. uh, but we always reassure the patient that um, even they, they don't look like uh, nice, they are yellow, uh, but that doesn't mean that they are sick. Uh, it's just a recovery period for, uh, for the liver. Excellent. And with acute uh, hepatitis, viral, acute viral hepatitis, how how going to you know, separate you know, that uh, disease? For acute hepatitis? Yes, acute viral hepatitis. So um, here, usually, we'll have to go into the, for the lab tests. For, it will differentiate whether you have hepatitis A or hepatitis B or hepatitis C, depending sure. on the lab test that you order. Uh, there are some specific tests that can differentiate between an acute infection uh, or a chronic, if we are suspecting a virus that can mm -hmm. present in both ways, like hepatitis B or C. Uh, for hepatitis A, again, there is a blood test that can tell you if the patient has an acute infection. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is for acute. What, what about the chronic? How will it spread? Okay, chronic hepatitis. Oh, mm -hmm. the spread. Yeah, mm -hmm. so for um, the spread of chronic hepatitis, so now we are talking about hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Sure, yeah, A and B, how they spread, okay, for the. Okay. Yeah, okay, so for the spread for hepatitis, uh, again, I have to put them in two acute categories and again. Chronic. So hepatitis A um, and hepatitis E, the one that's almost exactly uh, like hepatitis A. They both spread from um, oral intake. Like right. if they, uh, someone eats uh, contaminated food, they would get an infection. But luckily, they will always be acute infections and they will not linger. Fecal oral, right? Okay. Yeah, fecal oral, what we call fecal oral. It's just something that uh, usually the patient would eat. Mm -hmm. um, for the chronic hepatitis, whether it's B or C, uh, the oral roots or what we eat is almost never a uh, cause yes. of an infection. So that's uh, reassuring for, uh, for us as population because it doesn't spread that easily. Usually those viruses need to be spread through blood or something that transmits blood at a microscopic level. So they can be uh, from blood products, they can be from like procedures that we do, like dental procedures, uh, patients who get undergo like dialysis for uh, renal failure. Um, between uh, like husband and wife, sexual transmission is also one of the causes because th there's some uh, microscopic blood uh, transmitted. In the house, there's a lot of, not a lot of things that can transmit the virus. Mainly the, maybe the toothbrush, um, the nail clipper, uh, maybe probably those are the only things that can transmit the, uh, the virus with, or the, the shaving uh, uh, like tools also can transmit the virus. But like sharing the utensils, the, uh, the plates, uh, the cups never transmit hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And that is very important because we don't need to isolate uh, those who have chronic uh, hepatitis. I think that's very important, you know, because there is a lot of misconception, you know, and misperception around the mode of transmission of uh, viral sure. hepatitis, as you have illustrated clearly that, uh, you know, sharing the home, okay, utensils or cubs does not cause uh, hepatitis because it's like we hear in the let's say media or public always they talk about this if you uh, share you know the cup or the utensil the uh, if you enlighten us more about yeah. this so yeah. that's a very important point because if we treat patients as like they are infective for everything that they touch they would put them like in a shell isolation uh, yeah okay. we will isolate them that will be traumatic from different perspectives, from social, from psychological uh, trauma to the patients. So we need to be aware. And that's, again, one of the deficits that we have. Like we have a, a gap of awareness uh, in the patients and their uh, relatives. Sometimes even the patients, when they come to me in the clinic, they say, OK, I don't want to shake your hand. I don't want to infect you. I don't, no, come oh, on, let's shake my hand. There's yes. nothing wrong with it. So that's, I think, one of the gaps of the awareness. Patients who have chronic hepatitis B or C, it is very difficult to spread the virus. And again, unless with the, the mo uh, methods that we have mentioned. Uh, the daily uh, like uh, interactions usually doesn't uh, cause an infection. So you mentioned the uh, sexual you know, intercourse, 
uh, vertical transmission? Is it possible yeah. from the yes. mother to the fetus? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's like another uh, mode of transmission. Um, for hepatitis B, uh, it would depend on how high the, uh, the viral load, how much of the virus is replicating in the, uh, in the liver and how much of, the, of it in the, uh, in the blood. So that's a blood test that can be easily done during pregnancy. And if we notice that this uh, number of the virus is climbing, then we can give treatment to decrease the chances of transmitting the virus to the, to the fetus. Uh, on, for hepatitis C, on the other hand, um, we cannot treat patients who are pregnant uh, for the time being, but the chances of transmission are quite low. Uh, like the highest number that we have from the literature is around 5%. So it's, it's, uh, it's a mo method of transmission, but uh, it, is, it is rare. Okay, it's rare. Excellent. Uh, we'll go for a report about uh, viral uh, hepatitis. To watch more details about this report, stay with us. Don't go away. Viral hepatitis is an inflammation of the liver caused by a virus. There are at least five known types which exhibit similar symptoms but are spread in different ways. While symptoms can indicate the presence of hepatitis, a blood test remains the only way to diagnose it and to identify its type. The elderly and people who suffer from liver disease have a higher risk of developing a fatal hepatitis infection. People infected with hepatitis virus should not consume alcohol. The hepatitis A virus is excreted in human feces and is contracted orally through physical contact, by eating raw or undercooked food, especially fruits, vegetables, and shellfish, or by drinking contaminated water. Generally, people infected by hepatitis A experience flu-like symptoms. Symptoms usually disappear within two months, and the person has developed an immunity to, to the virus for life. Infected individuals are contagious until one week after the onset of jaundice. Hepatitis E is similar to hepatitis A as it's transmitted via the digestive system and heals on its own, with few exceptions. This infection is found mainly in the Indian subcontinent and can be fatal to pregnant women. Hepatitis type A and E heals on their own. To avoid spreading hepatitis type A and E, you should wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. And if you're in a region prone to hepatitis, avoid consuming water or any products that has been in contact with water. If needed, an effective vaccine is available against hepatitis A. Hepatitis B is transmitted through unprotected sexual intercourse, sharing contaminated needles, or contact with contaminated blood or bodily fluids. Hepatitis type C is generally transmitted via the blood, sharing contaminated needles, blood transfusions, tattooing or piercing, but can also be sexually transmitted. Many people infected with hepatitis B or C never feel ill and will eliminate the virus completely. If symptoms appear, they resemble those of hepatitis A. However, some people can develop a chronic infection that leads to cirrhosis or the cancer of the liver. People who are HIV positive have a greater risk of developing cirrhosis of the liver if they're infected by the hepatitis B or C virus. Studies have shown that it's possible to transmit the virus to the newborn. Doctors usually do a test for hepatitis B on all pregnant women at the beginning of the pregnancy and prepare a treatment plan if the results are positive. Depending on the patient, they also test other forms of hepatitis if required. Hepatitis D is transmitted the same way as hepatitis B. It also develops only in the presence of hepatitis B and exhibits similar symptoms. Today, medications are available to treat chronic hepatitis B. However, these treatments are not recommended for everyone and they do not eliminate the virus completely, but they can reduce damage to the liver. Even if you do not need treatment, it's important to see a hepatologist, a, a doctor specialized in the liver, or another doctor who is experienced in hepatitis B. For chronic hepatitis type C, a course of antiviral medication for a period of 6 to 12 months appears to be effective. Up to 50% of patients recover from the infection. 
To avoid spreading or contracting hepatitis B, C, or D, you need to use a condom and never share your needles or personal items that can contain traces of blood, such as your toothbrush or razor. You should also keep open wounds or sore covered, disinfect any surface contaminated with blood, as well as never donate blood organs or sperm. If you have been exposed to the virus of hepatitis B for less than a week, you can receive immunoglobulin therapy. In addition, vaccination is available against hepatitis B. In all cases, we strongly recommend vaccination against hepatitis B. Talk to your doctor, as hepatitis B vaccination programs are available at no charge. Regrettably, there is no vaccine against hepatitis C. Once again, welcome back to Elixir of Life. It's our honor uh, to present my distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Abdullah Khathlan, who is consultant, uh, gastroenterologist, and transplant hepatologist, and our episode theme, viral hepatitis. Welcome, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, again. Just to continue the discussion uh, we posed on, uh, uh, is there any vaccination for uh, viral hepatitis, and who should get uh, vaccinated? Yeah. So I think this is one of the most important things that we can talk about uh, today in regard to hepatitis uh, in general. So again, uh, we are separating the viruses to hepatitis A, B, and C mainly. This is the, uh, those are the viruses that are common in our population. Um, we have vaccination that can give an excellent protection from hepatitis A and hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they have both been implemented recently, like hepatitis A has been recently implemented in our national vaccination program. Uh, so all uh, children are now vaccinated for hepatitis uh, A. Hey, this is new. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, relatively new now. It has been only for a few years. For hepatitis B, I've, as I've mentioned before, it has been a major success story for hepatitis. Uh, like We can be uh, proud of this even on a global scale because we have dropped the incidence of hepatitis B from like 10 percent to less than 1 percent in young children. Uh, and this was only like, achieved by uh, implementing a rigorous uh, vaccination program, which now we can see the fruits of those, uh, this program. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have vaccination for uh, hepatitis C yet, although there is some research uh, in that regard. But the good thing that we now have some new tools to uh, like fight hepatitis C that we can talk about that uh, uh, later. So excellent. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, you, you covered nicely, you know, the, the types of viral hepatitis, the clinical presentation, uh, diagnosis. Uh, just before we move to treatment, which is the most important topic, uh, what's the gold standard uh, test to diagnose viral hepatitis? Just to say that confirmed, okay? Yeah. This can be clinic, is it clinical diagnosis only or? Well, it's difficult to say clinical only. Uh, it's, you can have a high suspicion for hepatitis uh, in general when you have a typical scenario. Again, someone who has hepatitis A and then his brother develops uh, jaundice or yellow discretion of the eyes, then probably it's hepatitis A. But overall, you always need to confirm it by uh, doing some uh, blood tests. So the uh, blood tests that we typically do are uh, the liver enzymes. Those are substances that get secreted from the hepatocytes or the liver cells when they get injured. They are not specific for hepatitis particularly, like for the viral hepatitis, but uh, anything that can cause uh, liver injury can cause elevation of those enzymes. But it's important to confirm that they are elevated. So that's the first step when you are dealing with acute hepatitis. Followed by, an, again, a specific blood test for each virus. Each one has its own set of blood tests that can confirm whether the patient has acute infection or a chronic infection, uh, and basically can uh, say whether the virus is there or not. So it's like a serology test? Okay. Yes, yeah, serological test. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one that we call polymerase chain reaction, PCR, so that one we can actually count uh, the viral uh, load uh, in the serum, especially in the chronic hepatitis B and C. We can uh, quantify how much of the virus in, is in the blood, and that can play a major role in our treatment decision whether we will need to treat the patients or not, especially for hepatitis B. So there is uh, like uh, indirect like antibodies or direct the antigen or yeah. the... Mm. So, and that's very important, especially for hepatitis C, uh, because we have the antibody, as you mentioned, which is relatively a cheap test that can be done anywhere. Uh, it is very good because it can tell you if the patient has been exposed previously to hepatitis C. 
However, it cannot tell you whether the patient has been cured or not. Mm -hmm. And that can be like problematic for someone who's been cured and we have like eradicated hepatitis C completely. But the, uh, like the trace of hepatitis that has been exposed to the body, like the body has been exposed is the antibody. It will always stay mm -hmm. even 10 years or 15 years after the infection. So if the patient gets cured from hepatitis C and then go to do marriage testing, for instance, uh, they will tell him, oh, you're still infected. But it's that misleading because they are not doing the, uh, like the accurate test. They are doing just the, uh, the simple test, which is the antibody. Okay, very interesting. Okay. And is there any treatment for uh, viral hepatitis, uh, you know, generally speaking, and uh, particularly uh, hepatitis uh, C? Yeah, so overall, the acute hepatitis doesn't uh, need treatments. Uh, hepatitis A, again, and hepatitis E. Um, all what the patient needs is just um, make sure that they get hydrated, uh, they get uh, proper uh, nutritional support. If they have some pain, they will give them something for pain, for itching. Again, just managing the symptoms. Symptomatic yeah, support. Rather than, yeah, rather than uh, treating the virus itself, because the immune system usually will take care of it. For chronic hepatitis, on the other hand, um, the patient will have to go uh, for like rigorous evaluation and um, that at the end we will make a decision whether the patient will need treatment uh, or not. Uh, that is particularly true for hepatitis B because the treatments that we have for hepatitis B until now are treatments that would transform the, uh, the patient from an uh, chronic infection to a carrier state which means that the virus will stay there but it will have no effects on the, on the uh, liver cells. Um, we don't have yet for hepatitis B a treatment that eradicate the virus completely, unfortunately. So that's why we have, before we initiate treatment for hepatitis B, we have to make sure that the patients actually require uh, treatment for hep B. On the other hand, hepatitis C now, because we have treatment that is effective, that is relatively uh, easy to use and will eradicate the virus completely, we like to treat uh, anyone who has hepatitis C. And that is a major change uh, that we have like recently and over the last uh, three to four years compared with the past. As recent as like seven years ago, we only have uh, or we only had um, uh, injections to treat hepatitis C. It was called interferon. It has a major side effects. It was taken for uh, a year or even more. At the end, the chances of cure were like uh, 50 to 60 percent at best. So the patient would suffer for a year uh, with a lot of side effects and then at the end like one patient will be cured and the other will not. Recently, like again the last three, four, five years, uh, we've got the new medications that are only tablets. They are excellent, they are very effective um, and they are used for a relatively short time, three months, sometimes even two months. Uh, with a favorable side effect profile, they don't have a lot of side effects and the chances of cure are exceeding 90%. Like anything now, um, that is less than 90% is not acceptable for us as physicians or as hepatologists. So that's a major uh, uh, improvement that we have. Yes, so the eradication rate uh, or sexes is 99% human? Yes, 90% uh, or more. Uh, that's now for hepatitis C. We only accept uh, the uh, treatment to be 90% uh, or more. Okay, that's very interesting. It's, it's considered one of the breakthrough or the, I would say, the landmark in the history of medicine to have. Yeah, it's one of the rare uh, success stories that we have in uh, medicine that we can cure a chronic infection. Like if you look at hepatitis B or uh, HIV, uh, until now we cannot cure uh, those infections. Usually with the best that we can is control the virus. Uh, for hepatitis C, this is probably one of the rare viruses that are chronic and that can, that can be cured uh, now with relative ease. So that's, that's again a major uh, advancement that we have. Excellent. So how, do you, how to monitor you know, the response to uh, therapy, to the new antiviral uh, uh, hepatitis C therapy, the baseline and the follow-up? So uh, to be before we begin for hepatitis C, we need to do some uh, like basic tests because, because hepatitis C has what we call uh, like subtypes. Um, we call them genotypes. Excellent. So um, hepatitis C has like major six families or uh, genotypes from one to six. In our uh, population in the kingdom here in Saudi Arabia, we have um, uh, genotype four as the major uh, cause of uh, hepatitis C compared with uh, the West where they have uh, mainly hepatitis uh, uh, genotype 1A.
genotype 1A. 1A, okay. Yeah. So we have four. Yeah. So is it, you know, has, you know, any, uh, I would say, uh, favorable uh, outcome that uh, genotyping, so being genotype uh, four is like more um, responsive yeah. to therapy than genotype one? Or yeah. Well, um, if you want to put like a scale, probably the easiest one to treat is uh, genotype two, which is unfortunately rare here. Um, followed by genotype 1B and genotype 4, and luckily those are the most common uh, genotypes in our uh, kingdom. Like uh, around 60 to 65 percent of our population are genotype 4, and 30 percent are genotype 1B. Uh, the uh, after that is genotype 1A, and the most difficult genotype is genotype 3. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we don't have a lot of genotype 3 in, in the kingdom, but still, even for genotype 3, uh, the most difficult one, uh, we have treatments that are. 90% or more uh, for success rate. So Excellent. even with the difficulty, we are uh, achieving success. Even like, uh, I mean, nowadays, the genotype does not play, you know, major role because the therapy is very effective true. regardless of the genotype. Yeah, true. Uh, though the medications that we have, we have different types of medications. So some medications will work on certain genotype, but not the other. Ah, so that so will determine the... So that's still important to, uh, to know the genotype. Uh, because again, some medications will work on uh, like genotype 4, but not genotype 3, and vice versa. So still it's important to know the genotype for uh, hepatitis before we uh, proceed for treatment. So that's one of the major things that we need to do before Excellent. we um, uh, decide on the uh, treatment choice. The other one is that we need to know how bad is the liver damaged from the chronic hepatitis. Um, previously, we used to do liver biopsies. We just stick a needle in the liver and we take a sample and we analyze it under the microscope. But uh, recently, we have like uh, there been a recent development that's uh, a machine that's called FibroScan. Non-invasive. Huh? Non-invasive, exactly. Just like an ultrasound, it can measure the stiffness uh, of the liver. The more the, the liver is stiff, uh, the more uh, diseased uh, the, we can anticipate the liver to be. And that has like eliminated the need for uh, liver biopsy in almost 90% of the, of the cases. We very rarely require now uh, sticking a needle in the liver and taking a sample. So that's um, again a major, major advance and it's very important to know because again the duration of the therapy and which therapy can be used will depend on which stage of the stage. disease. Uh, if the patient has completely normal liver, we can use a short uh, term therapy. If it, the disease is advanced, then we probably need to either prolong the treatment or use um, like additional medications to uh, fight the virus. I think this uh, point, you know, uh, leading us to the next question, who should get the therapy? Let's say it's early stage uh, versus advanced stage, we call it uh, cirrhosis, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was one of the major like, issues that we have in the past. Um, previously, we could not give the treatment for everyone. The main uh, like problem that we faced is the cost of the medications. The cost uh, was like around quarter of a million for each patient, which uh, limited the access for uh, patient initially, not only here, globally. Or everywhere, uh, there was a difficulty to treat everyone. So we used to treat those who are in greater need for uh, treatments, those who have advanced uh, liver disease. They cannot wait. Uh, luckily, again, as I mentioned, we have now started to produce those medications locally. Uh, so the cost has significantly dropped, uh, dramatically actually dropped, uh, like from a quarter of a million. Now it can cause like cost like 20,000 or 30,000 real. So like more than 90% drop in the, the price. And because of that, now the ministry has a plan to treat everyone. So everyone can be treated, but still there are some uh, like uh, subtypes of, or uh, groups of patients that will be difficult to treat, namely those who have very advanced liver disease, like uh, the liver has failed, uh, it cannot function uh, properly. And those patients giving treatment can be dangerous because it can accelerate the, uh, like the liver damage and that can be dangerous. Um, and that's why usually we push those uh, patients to go for liver transplants rather than uh, treatment. The other group of patients is that like patients who are pregnant, we typically don't uh, know how safe are those medications in pregnancy, so we don't uh, treat pregnant uh, ladies. We just wait until they are they deliver their babies and then uh, we treat them. Uh, otherwise, patients who have like combined infections like hepatitis B and hepatitis C, sometimes there's a concern that if you treat those patients um, and the hepatitis B has been sleeping or like uh, not active, you may activate the other virus. 
So that's another thing that we typically keep an eye on if we have um, a combined infection. And if the patient have combined infection with, with HIV? So HIV, again, um, it's relatively now very easy to treat them. Uh, in the past, when we had only the interferon or the injections, it was a major problem to treat such patients. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, like we only need to uh, look at the interactions between the HIV medications and our own medications. But beyond that, we are again achieving great success uh, with rates of cure exceeding uh, 90%. Excellent. That's a very important uh, point, uh, Dr. Abdullah, you have illustrated. And uh, suppose that a patient who received uh, the new uh, therapy and failed. Mm -hmm. So can he be exposed to the therapy again, the new therapy or? Um, so that's, yeah, that's a very important uh, question. And we get asked this question a lot from our patients. Again, the rates of cure are exceedingly high. Like. Um, um, above 90, but realistically uh, more even more than 95%. Like from my experience, I've treated more than around 300 patients. Uh, only two of them failed. Um, so the rates are great. But if the patient failed on those excellent medications, that's not the end of the road. We still can treat those who failed. Um, we will usually uh, use a combination of multiple medications in the second uh, go. Like for if we treat initially with two medications and the second time we'll treat them with three medications rather than mm -hmm. two in order to achieve success. And we have some studies done on those particular patients who failed. If we use the proper uh, regimen in the second go, we can again achieve more than 90% chance of, of cure. So even failing the, uh, the first course doesn't mean that the patient will not be cured. We can still cure them, inshallah, with the second course. Okay, so there is always the, there is hope. Uh, uh, now, just for the public, let's say that they have a relative, uh, okay, patient with viral hepatitis C. How they, you know, what's the proper channel to get treatment? For the, is it always tertiary care hospital, like the say King Fahd Medical Center, or available in primary and secondary healthcare? Uh, so this that? is the thing that you now we are working on in the ministry. Unfortunately, now we don't have access for those medications uh, except in big hospitals mm -hmm. because the major concern in the past was the cost. Um, the cost was very high, so we could not like allo allocate those medications unless there is a consultant who is uh, specialized in the specialty on the liver to prescribe those medications. But within the next few months, the vision of the ministry is that we're going to train a lot of the primary health care physicians to be able to treat uh, hepatitis C. So any primary health care uh, center will be able to treat uh, the patients. Of course, that will be uh, true for the patients who are relatively easy to, tr uh, to treat. Straightforward patients. Yeah, straightforward. They don't have advanced liver disease. So they will. anyone can treat them. Any physician can uh, prescribe the medication mm -hmm. because, again, they are simple. They are safe. Uh, patients who are more advanced uh, will require a referral to uh, like a tertiary care center like our center and uh, they will be met by a, a specialized team to address all their needs. Mm -hmm. And now the current standard of care is only hepatologist yeah. or gastroenterologist. Even not gastroenterologist, hepatologist is yeah. the one who is, you know, uh, authorized to treat uh, hepatitis C. True. But again, that's going to change. Um, we've sat with the, uh, in the ministry and we have like um, a team that is planning ahead uh, because we have uh, a vision to eradicate hepatitis C uh, by 2030. This is both local and international uh, goals. That's uh, going with the theme of... Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, we know that if we limit the access of those medications to only a few uh, experts, it's going to be difficult to treat a lot of patients. So the plan would be to train the uh, general practitioners uh, to prescribe so those medications. And they, uh, once we believe that uh, this general practitioner can do that in a safe manner, for, uh, for the patients, they will be qualified to prescribe it. I, I think within the next year, um, most of the doctors will be able to prescribe uh, treatment for hepatitis C. Because we are now like internal medicine, uh, we refer this such patient to a hepatologist. I think this is, will be great, you know, idea, and it will uh, help to uh, eliminate uh, the virus yeah, by, true. you know, widening, you know, the circle of uh, or privilege of prescribing these uh, medications. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, what are the anticipated or potential uh, side effects of these uh, medications compared to the old generation of uh, antiviral uh, uh, therapy? So again, we're uh, talking about the treatment for hepatitis C. C yes. um, 
like again six years ago, we uh, we had only one uh, medication, only the interferon, interferon the yeah. injections. What are these? Again, same? the side effects were numerous, um, like flu-like symptoms. Uh, patients uh, will have like depressed mood. Uh, it, this can be severe enough that the patient may even think about hurting himself at uh, at certain points. Suicidal point. attempt. Yeah, um, it can cause by itself. It can cause hepatitis. Uh, so you are giving it to treat hepatitis, but it can induce uh, hepatitis. Mm -hmm. It can cause problems with the synthesis of blood. So the, all the blood products can uh, decrease, like with the white uh, blood cells, the uh, hemoglobin, the platelets. They can all drop, which can have major side effects and major complication from that. It can cause thyroid problem. It can cause eye problem. Again, the side effects profile for interferon, if I have to list it, we have to like spend an hour uh, talking sure. about it. It is extensive. And the, the other bad thing about it, again, as I mentioned, it was not really, um, the chances of success were, were low. Now, the new medications that we have, compared with the interferon, they have very limited side effects. Mainly? Nothing, yeah, nothing again, without side effect. Sure. All medications have side effects. Mainly, it's going to be something mild like uh, upset stomach, some abdominal pain, some nausea, uh, some skin uh, rashes, but nothing, nothing major. The only thing that is important, um, I believe, is the interactions. Okay. Some of the interactions can be uh, dangerous. And few of them are actually lethal. Like a patient may die if they uh, if they take the, this medication, uh, the, the hepatitis C medication, with some uh, some of the uh, the medications that we relatively commonly use. I'm going to mention two of them spe uh, specifically. Uh, one of them is used for uh, controlling the heart rate uh, or problems with the heart rate. It's called amiodarone. Amiodarone, yes. Anyone who's using amiodarone and has hepatitis C, they need to. Uh, tell their physician or uh, hepatologist that I'm taking amiodarone, or even I've taken amiodarone a long time ago because the half-life for amiodarone is long and can stay in the body for weeks after stopping. And so if you've been exposed to amiodarone, please tell your physician that you've been exposed. So that's one. The other one is mostly all the medications that are used for uh, epilepsy, mm -hmm. uh, anything that's used for uh, convulsions. So most, most of those medications, again, they have major uh, interactions with, um, uh, with our uh, new uh, hepatitis C treatments. There's only one that doesn't have major interactions. I'm not going to mention the names, and we're not uh, going to, to promote, just, yeah, yes. promote any. Mm -hmm. But again, speak with your uh, consultant. Tell them that I have um, treatments for convulsions, and uh, they will uh, know what to do. There's actually a very uh, useful tool uh, on, the, on, on the internet. It's called HEP Interactions. You just can mm -hmm. go, uh, Google it and go in uh, there, put the medication's name, and you can see whether there is uh, green uh, color, which means that you're go ahead, no problems, yellow, stop, red, please no, don't you do it. This Excellent. can be done by the patients or by the physician. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, any brief, because they are running short of time. Uh, what are... Um, if the patient receiving uh, the anti-hepatitis C uh, therapy and get pregnant? So, yeah, um, there are two things here. Um, first of all, before we start treatment, we need to tell the patient they should not get pregnant. Should avoid pregnancy. But one particular drug, it's called ribavirin, um, that has a black box warning. Like if you take the, uh, the medication and turn it, there will be a picture of a woman pregnant and big X on it because it can cause major uh, like uh, teratogenicity or like malformations in the baby. Mm. So that is very dangerous. We sh always need to uh, emphasize on the patient that they need to take two actually contraceptive uh, methodologies to prevent uh, pregnancies. Uh, if they get pregnant on the other medications, uh, then it will depend at what stage is the treatment. If it's just starting, then we can stop. If it's advanced, we are almost finishing. Again, we can stop the medication. We can just, if it's like 10 weeks, uh, we can say 10 weeks is enough uh, rather than 12 weeks. But we don't have like a major recommendation. We can uh, individualize our uh, decision based on each case. Dr. Abdullah, just to conclude uh, for our uh, very insightful episode, what's the take home message? Okay. So, yeah, the take home message I believe is that um, hepatitis uh, treatment has undergone a major uh, like revolution in the la last uh, three, four years, especially for hepatitis C. Uh, whether it's, again, hepatitis B or hepatitis C, treatment is available. Uh, don't, like, um, let the disease take control of you. Take control of the disease. Uh, seek help. And uh, usually we'll have a treatment and support for uh, patients with hepatitis C. Um, and um, 
with, with our support, uh, we usually are able to make the patients live a normal life and productive life. And they can, they should not change their uh, daily life. They can enjoy their sure. daily life and live like other uh, yeah. people. They can uh, live a productive life. They can marry. They can get children. Again, don't let the, the virus control you. You need to control the virus. So it's not a stigma. It's not social stigma anymore. It, it should never have been. Uh, but again, this is a cultural issue that uh, uh, it is here and other uh, cultures as well. Always those who have hepatitis are like uh, they have some stigma. That's completely wrong. Uh, we should always uh, be aware about hepatitis. What is it? How is it spread? And once we know like the full picture, we'll be, this uh, misbelief uh, will be gone and we'll treat those patients with the dignity that they deserve. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Abdullah Al-Khatlan, consultant, uh, gastroenterologist, and uh, hepatologist with a uh, subspecialty uh, of uh, uh, liver transplant. It's been a great pleasure and honor uh, being with us to talk about very important uh, public health uh, issue as uh, viral hepatitis, in thank particular hepatitis C. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. And thank hopefully so we see you again in our program. Inshallah. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, now we are coming to the end of our uh, program. Before I conclude, uh, I would like to thank our great uh, team, uh, starting by uh, preparation team, Rahab Khlaitit, and uh, ending up by our director, uh, Abdullah Al-Wali'i, and uh, myself, uh, your host, Dr. Mohammed Al-Shif. Uh, until next week, we wish you a pleasant week ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Goodbye.